breakfast. I hoofed a small pile of bottle caps across the sheep metal counter while a scarred pony with a dark tan coat and a roasting meat cutie mark pulled a rabbit shish kebab from the barbecue grill. Guests or not, we were expected to pay for our food. I'm not sure why I'd expected otherwise. I picked up my meal, the savory aroma assaulting my nostrils, and carried it over to the table where Calamity was already digging into his bowl of oatmeal. Little Pip, what are you doing? Velvet Remedy nearly shrieked as she saw me approach. I stopped short, looking at her quizzically. Velvet Remedy looked stricken. You're not going to eat that, are you? I nodded, unable to respond with the shish kebab still in my mouth. My stomach was rumbling. I sucked up a bit of escaping drool and was hit by the flavors of the barbecued rabbit. It wasn't quite as good as what I was expecting, and made my stomach do an odd lurch, but it was good. Little Pip. Velvet raised her hoof to her chest and exaggerated offense. That's meat! Uh-huh. I mouthed through my breakfast, hoping in vain that having established this fact, I would be allowed to eat in peace. Velvet Remedy's eyes narrowed. We're vegetarians, she said flatly. I paused at that. True, all I had ever eaten in Stable 2 was apples, but I assumed that was because it was the only thing we had for eating, and I felt I would be perfectly happy never eating another apple as long as I lived. I thought back to my first meals outside, how I had found cooked meat stored in a refrigerator, and simply assumed that's what ponies ate in this wasteland. My stomach had fought it uncomfortably, but I figured that was more the result of a lifetime of apples, and that outside food was just taking some getting used to. For the most part, I'd acclimated well. Of course, now that I thought about it, it had been a Raider refrigerator, so diet was suspect. Calamity finally pulled his head out of his oatmeal bowl, winging in on the conversation. Well, we can eat meat all right, just don't like too much, and really good for our diet. Calamity looked sideways, his oatmeal-covered lips curling into a frown. My brothers used to challenge me to hot dog eating contests, which mostly meant them shoving the disgusting things down my throat. Velvet Remedy looked appalled. Of course, they were probably disgusting more because they were 200 years old than because they were meat. I felt my appetite slip. Ugh. By Celestia's grace, I hoped they'd at least been kept frozen that entire time. Velvet Remedy turned up her nose and trotted away from our table. She was just leaving as God alighted next to us with a plate of roasted rats. She watched Velvet shudder in disgust and quicken her pace. Sucking up a rat by the tail and swallowing it whole, God turned to ask me, What's her issue? I suppose you'll be heading out after breakfast, then? God asked. Between bites of grilled vegetables and rabbit meat, I had told God about Red Eye's forces. She'd taken it in with grave expression. Do you want that escort? It was a question that had plagued me all night. Not the escort issue, but leaving now in the first place. We could leave now, put Shattered Hoof completely behind us, get out before the impending drama, and leave these ponies to the fates they had created for themselves. It was, I had to admit, not without its appeal, especially considering that the alternatives most certainly involved getting shot at with a high chance of dying. Was there anyone or anything here worth risking my life or the lives of my companions? I... I've been considering staying, I admitted, just for a little longer. God smirked at that. On the other side of the bottle cap, I didn't have any place else pressing to be. I didn't have a home. The one friendly town I had countered so far had just kicked me out. I was still as lost and adrift as ever before. I felt like I had in Stable 2 when I was without my cutie mark, without a place. Same feeling, only the walls had changed. Even the ceiling was gray, just a little higher. I was the pony with the pit buck on her flank, a symbol that didn't mean anything special in Stable 2, didn't mean anything at all in the wasteland. Watcher had told me to search for my virtue. What virtue did I have if I walked away? Okay. Sanity, perhaps. Was sanity a virtue? Self-preservation? Truth be told, I didn't really have a larger mission. Personally, I found slavery a vile practice, and I wanted to take it out on Red Eye. And yes, I had seen signs that Red Eye was involved in something big, but it was only curiosity and worry that cajoled me into investigating. I could leave under the auspice that I was moving forward in the goal of stopping Red Eye, if indeed that was going to be my goal. But the small army here just over those hills are Red Eye's ponies. And if I really wanted to take the slavers on, why not here? Maybe we should talk, Calamity told me pointedly. God was staring at me thoughtfully, obviously weighing options. Finally, she came to a decision. If you're interested in staying, I have a contract to offer you. I raised my eyebrows. Oh? 
How would you feel in taking out dead eyes for me? My ears shot up. Calamity stared in surprise. Me? Why? God grimaced. Because if you don't, I'll have to do it myself. And while I'm convinced it's within the wingspan of my contract with Mr. Topaz to do so, the political fallout wouldn't be good. Dead Eyes has got a lot of supporters, and I don't relish watching for the spear at my back. I don't see how high enough to take this fella out is going to make you any less of a target. Might not, God agreed, but it's worth a try. If, she added, turning her stare towards me, you're up for it. My mind reeled. Was I up to killing Dead Eyes? Hell, I'd all been waiting to do that. I'd been contemplating that and more. But to be hired to do so. I was already a vigilante, but was I ready to be an assassin? I'd been out of the stable more than a week, less than two. If I did this now, what will I have become by the end of the month? By my next birthday? Um, I'll think about that, I answered honestly. God frowned. Of course you would want an answer right away. There wasn't exactly much time. We had less than a day before Red Eye's people marched into Shattered Hoof. It occurred to me that, considering what I knew of God and the towns, she'd have more respect for me if I asked. What would we get out of it? What's the pay? I swear, the hint of a smile touched God's beak. Dead Eyes has a key. Keeps it hidden in his tail at all times. Key opens a vault under Shattered Hoof, down where the old mines are. Made sense. Naturally, a place like Shattered Hoof would be built on top of a set of gem mines. They couldn't have always relied on just the rock farms. When the gem mines ran dry, what else was there to do with them but use them as storage? Diamond Tiara's last message had even said something about sending the best gems below. What's in the vault? God smirked. Your payment, whatever that happens to be. Could be gems, could be weapons. Pre-apocalypse ponies used gemstones from Shattered Rock to build magical energy weapons. Considering that the army was filled with them, it's a fair assumption that the vault might have even more. The idea of storing a mass of magical energy weapons just beneath a prison seemed more than marginally insane to me. After all, surely they didn't build the things there. But then, if I killed Dead Eyes, it wasn't going to be for the reward anyway. You can't do this! Velvet Remedy stomped and snorted about the cattle car, empty but for the three of us. Little Pip... It's one thing to kill in self-defense, or to protect others, but this... She turned on me with a stare that could petrify the overmare herself. This is murder. Calamity was scowling. I have to agree with Velvet Remedy on this one, little pip, he said flatly. I understand the talents, can even respect them just a bit, but I ain't a mercenary. You do this, I ain't with you. Velvet cut deeper. You know that song I was writing about staying noble and true? That was about you, little Pip. And this is you failing that, on every level. To even consider this. She backed away from me, her voice softening with regret. I am so disappointed in you. I felt like I was bleeding out, dying. But the more they yelled at me, the more I realized I had already chosen my course. I just had to make them understand why. Silver Bell. Both of them quieted, staring at me. After a long, pregnant pause, Calamity asked, What's Silver Bell got to do with any of this? I felt weak, but I clamped down on my resolve. Silver Bell's mother and father were murdered by raiders, and they made Silver Bell and her sister watch. Do you remember that? I could see Velvet Remedy's expression quiver. Of course we... They made them watch. I emphasized each word with a stomp of a hoof. And they made it slow. Really slow, and really painful, and really horrible. I asked again. Do you remember that? My companions were both silent. Those raiders came from here, I told them finally. And they were acting on Dead Eyes' orders. Spitting. I saw it for myself in his ledger. Calamity spoke first. Well now, this changes things. Velvet Remedy shook a little, but stayed firm. What does it change? Ain't murder no more, Calamity stated without reservation. It's justice. Velvet shook her mane. Revenge, you mean. Nope, I mean justice. Pure and simple. 
Clammy nodded at me. I'm in. He glanced at my horn meaningfully. How's your TK? Rested wondrous. I won't be juggling train cars, I admitted. But I think I can manage barrels. How's your wing? Velvet Remedy's eyes jumped between the two of us and over and over. With a touch of desperation in her voice, she tried. Are you planning on finding out which raiders were involved in killing them too? Or are you just going to lay waste to the whole of Shattered Hoof? They're raiders, Calamity said evenly, stretching his wing. Honestly, I've been wondering just why we're helping them out at all. I figure, let them and the slavers duke it out. Stomp down what's left. I had another idea. Actually, not every pony here is bad. I was thinking of the rockbreaker I had talked with while he escorted me out. I think... I believe this place could be turned around. Maybe become a trading town instead of a raider fortress. Even as the words came out, I knew they were stupidly idealistic. But I pressed on. I'm thinking, kill Dead Eyes, Find Master Topaz and deal with him. Amiably if possible, lethally if not and then leave God in charge. Dead Eyes had told me to come back for one more job. Feeling the comforting weight of Little Macintosh in my saddlebags, my sniper rifle and assault carbine now returned to my back and side. I suspected this wasn't the job he had in mind. But his invitation was the perfect opportunity. I'd left Calamity back in the yard, reading through zebra infiltration tactics as I went in alone. He didn't like that one bit, but I explained that I planned to take the long way explore some wings of Shattered Hoof that I hadn't seen yet, including how to get down to the mine below. Seeing the yard in daylight for the first time, Clammy had immediately spotted the metal plates of a hydraulic cargo lift, but the controls were damaged beyond repair. If it worked at all, it would only be from the inside of the mine itself. There had to be another way. Somewhere, there was a door that went beneath the prison itself, and I wanted to know where it was. Now, I suspected, I had found it. I was behind the stage in the mess hall. To one side, the curtains, heavy and stained, concealed this darkened space from the large catwalked area where the raiders ate whatever passed for their meals. Enough dust had accumulated back here that I could tell no pony had ventured behind that curtain. Why would they? The space was full of rotting stage props and the skeletons of hundreds of ponies. Countless bones were stuffed into cabinets, spilled out of metal boxes, and formed piles that must have been three ponies high when they still had flesh. The guests of Shattered Hoof had spiraled into barbarism and cannibalism, and eventually every one of them had perished here. I'd found logs. I'd found graffiti. I had wondered why I wasn't tripping over their skeletons. Above, a huge mural spanned the wall. A painting of the same noble-looking soldier pony I had seen in the statue back in Ponyville, rearing up. Behind him, clear even though the mural was badly faded and chipped, was the goddess Celestia herself her divine features beaming with approval. Originally, I realized, this is what every pony who was a guest of Shattered Hoof would have seen each time they ate a meal. Until the stage had been built, hiding it away. There was a barred gate set into the wall, wide enough to pull a wagon through. Beyond, a small kill zone only a few yards deep with two magical energy turrets set into alcoves on the side, powered down. Beyond, a thick metal door. Based on the dead light above, I could tell the door had no power. I wanted inside, and not because there was a vault filled with possible treasure. Only Dead Eyes had a key to the vault, and only Dead Eyes had ever seen Mr. Topaz face to face. If Mr. Topaz really existed at all, I was dead certain he was down in that vault. My mind was conjuring up images of everything from a dedicated computer terminal that allowed Dead Eyes to speak with the very remote Mr. Topaz, to the vault being a stable, to Mr. Topaz the brain bot. The gate was locked. I had to push aside mounds of crumbling bones to get to it, holding my breath as white flakes stirred into the air. It took several minutes of effort, but the gate finally opened to my talents. The metal door, however, was another story entirely. It could only be opened by a terminal elsewhere in the building, and only then if I could restore power to it. I must have spent hours poking around Shattered Hoof, seeking to restore power to the door. It was just a simple matter of replacing a mouthful of fuses and swapping out a row of spark batteries, but those proved annoyingly difficult to find. I did find the armory through a side room of the guard barracks. It was completely devoid of weapons, no surprise as most of the raiders seemed to be armed with magical energy weapons that I assumed were looted from the armory. There was, however, 
a framed news article on the back wall, and behind it, a safe. As I took the frame off the wall, the photograph caught my eye. The scene was in the midst of a light winter snowfall. The picture was of a funeral. From the looks of it, a very important one, as the shadowy figures of two winged unicorns stood in the background, badly out of focus. One was markedly shorter than the other. My mind wanted to turn them into the goddesses Celestia and Luna. But that wasn't what had captured my attention. The photographer's eyes had focused on a mare, a single orange pony who, unlike all around her, had shunned the formal black dresses worn by the others to wear only a black cowgirl hat and a black kerchief around her neck with an image of half an apple embroidered into the front. The camera had caught a splash of light glistening off a falling tear as she dropped a single beautiful flower onto the casket. The mare's cutie mark, three apples, was identical to the design on Little Macintosh. All of Equestria mourns Big Macintosh, hero of Shattered Ridge. Two weeks ago, we didn't even know his name. But when Big Macintosh leapt in front of a zebra assassin's bullet meant for Princess Celestia, dying instantly, he also leapt into the hearts and minds of every loving and patriotic pony, becoming a paragon of courage, bravery, and self-sacrifice to all of Equestria. Funeral services were held this afternoon in the western courtyard of Ministry Walk. By a decree of Princess Luna, Pegasus ponies arranged for a light snow. The safe had opened to reveal two stealth bucks, the last spark batteries I needed, and a variety of ammo clips which, according to the documents found with them, were magically enchanted. Bullets for Little Macintosh, the needle gun, even Calamity's battle saddle, plus two types of weapons of a caliber I was unfamiliar with, although I suspected one type was for the multi-barreled battle saddles I'd seen the slavers use. I had just saddlebagged my new treasures and was putting the framed article back in place when the sound of raiders talking froze me. Sure they ain't gonna blow themselves all the hell back on the landmines? One voice, a stallion. A youthful-sounding mare snorted. Like I'd care all that much if they did. You have any idea what those damn slavers did to my town? I hastily finished replacing the frame and hugged a wall behind one of the empty sets of ammo shells. Ears alert. And y'all from Littlehorn? Heard they massacred that place. Nah. Would have been kinder to. They took all the mares and bucks they could, killed the rest and left them dead and rotting where they fell. But the colts and fillies? Red Eye doesn't have any use for kids, so they just left us behind to fend for ourselves. After a moment of awkward silence, she continued. The place went bad real fast. Hell, it was bad to start with so many of us seeing our parents sliced and splattered, but it got a whole lot worse. Got my tail out of there as quick as I could. So personally, I'd be more than happy if a good deal of this raiding party died screaming with their legs blown off. I could see the shadows of the two shattered hoof raiders move across the floor of the armory as they walked past, too deep in their conversation to notice if anything was amiss. Yep, I get that. But if Deadeye's traps work, we have a whole mess of those slavers as our slaves. Then you can take it out on them all slow and personal-like. I'm sure Deadeyes won't mind if a few of his new rock breakers are missing some non-vital internal organs. Their voices faded as they turned a corner somewhere out of sight. I let out a breath I didn't realize I was holding. My mind raced to put together what I had just heard. Dead Eyes wasn't, then, betraying Shattered Hoof to the Slavers after all. He was just tricking Red Eyes' forces into thinking he was, luring them into a trap. Of course, he wanted them to get in without any difficulties, and he was deceiving God into acting against him. Which, if this plan had the hoof stamp of approval from Mr. Topaz, or worse, was actually Mr. Topaz's plan, I needed to speak to God before I went shooting any pony. I want you to kill God. I stared at Dead Eyes. This was the second task he had for me. Feigning ignorance as best as I could yet again. Who? Dead Eyes snorted. Godina Grimfeathers. Griffin. Scar running up her beak and across her face. Only one eye. Can't miss her. He leaned forward with a sadistic smile. You do this, you're in. Part of my crew. Seeming pleased with himself, he sweetened the deal. Hell, I'll make you one of my personal guards. You'll get a nice room with some of the better food. I was at a loss for words. He was playing me. I knew it. But I was still totally thrown. I looked around like a drowning pony looking for a helping hoof. And once again, my eyes fell on the picture of Stable 2's first overmare, Sweetie Bell. I remembered something that Velvet Remedy had told me, something the Overmare had told her. Looking straight back at Dead Eyes, slate-gray eyes, I nodded firmly. 
Okay, not a problem. He blinked. Is that all? I asked as if killing God was the easiest thing in Equestria. He raised his eyebrows. No, I think that will do. I turned as if to leave, took a few steps and stopped. Looking over my shoulder. It's not like ponies here won't suspect you. You should have an alibi. His eyebrows raised further. Tell you what. I've got a plan that will take care of your griffin problem and leave you looking clean. His eyes narrowed now. Oh, do you? Please, do tell. Ever heard of a pony named Sweetie Belle? Dead Eyes blinked in surprise, then laughed. He pointed at the picture on the wall. Heard of her? A very song of hers you can find in the wasteland. Do you realize she actually performed here? Right down on that stage. He pointed his hoof in the direction of the mess hall. Take the stairs just outside my office, and it'll take you to the balcony where the Friendship Warden watched the performance. Wow. I had hoped Dead Eyes was at least familiar with the mare he had on his wall, but I never imagined the sadistic bastard was a fan. He stopped gushing, his voice turning colder. Why? I took a deep breath. Well, by now you know I didn't travel here alone. One of the ponies traveling with me just so happens to be a direct descendant of Sweetie Belle. And as it turns out, musical talent runs in the family. I had his attention. Her name is Velvet, and she's on her way to Manhattan to record some new music for DJ Pony's radio station. Wait, that's actually a pretty good idea. And it would give me a way to talk with the Wasteland's most famous buck. What I'm thinking, I think I can talk her into putting on a performance here, using that very stage. My mind was racing, trying to put together a decent-sounding plan as quickly as I spoke. We'll do it tonight. Invite every pony in to see it. And Gaudina Grimfeathers, too. Deadeyes, I could see, was liking this idea. And with the battle coming tomorrow morning, he had to be figuring the timing for a morale-boosting celebration was perfect. I'll be hiding up on the balcony. I'll take two shots, one through the head of the griffin, the other into your table, close enough to look like you were also a target. I levitated out one of the stealth bucks. I'll be gone before any pony can catch me or even see who it was. You can blame it on a slaver assassin. Who wouldn't buy that? Especially if every pony knew the slavers were due to attack en masse the next morning. Dead Eyes contemplated the plan while I stood there, feeling increasingly nervous. He had to realize this plan put him in the same crosshairs as God, and he already thought of me as her spy. Would he believe I would betray her so quickly that my loyalty was up for grabs? I like it. Dead Eyes broke into a grin. He clopped his hoofs together. Just one stipulation. Uh-oh. This velvet of yours. I want to hear at least two songs before you go interrupting the show, including something by Sweetie Belle. Um, any particular one? He smiled. Hell, I love them all. He leaned back. Surprise me. As I walked out of Dead Eyes' office, I took another look around. I remembered how Dead Eyes and his guards had gone off a different way before I stole the ledger. Now, I was surprised to find the passage led to stairs that wrapped around the balcony above. I looked it over. Shadowed. Occluded. It was a perfect sniping position. On my way back down the steps, I noticed a sickly apple-colored glow which I hadn't seen before. One of the terminals in one of the desks in the room outside of Dead Eyes' office was powered up. I was sure it hadn't been before. Replacing those fuses and spark batteries must have powered it up. Pulling out my access tool, I hacked into the terminal. There were no menus, no entries. Instead, just a single function. I had found the terminal that opened the door to the mines in the vault below. I'll put a bullet through Dead Eyes' head, I told God, and another into your table. Then, using a stealth buck to slip out before any pony can identify me. You can blame it on the slavers who are attacking tomorrow. God was pondering the idea skeptically. Sure, some ponies might still have suspicions, but not the kind that they could act on. Particularly if you take over the lead and grant them victory against the slavers. God shook her head. I've got to hand it to you. You one hell of a devious plotter. I felt a rush of pride and then immediately questioned if enjoying such praise spoke good or ill of me. A few minutes later, I joined Calamity and Velvet Remedy in the cattle car. Velvet Remedy was prancing around nervously. A show? With only hours to prepare? And why are we doing this again? 
Calamity was confused. Whose side are we on now? Same as before. Basic plan shouldn't change. But first, I want to get those two in the same room together. Velvet Remedy opened one of her saddle boxes, pulling out a notebook. Ooh, what songs will I do? Most of my music isn't really rate or appropriate. Somehow I don't think songs about peace and love or nobility or freedom are really their fare. Calamity whinnied. Well, most of the lot are escaped slaves. Velvet Remedy was checking down her list of songs. Well, that one's out. That one might work. Oh, that could be fun, but it was originally meant as a duet. I read in an old magazine that Pinkie Pie and Vinyl Scratch once performed at Hoofbeats. Eh, I could tweak it for one pony, but it really requires musical accompaniment. Maybe a Velvet Remy original. How about... I blinked, remembering. Well, Dead Eyes is expecting two songs before the attack. He says one of them has to be a song by Sweetie Belle. Velvet huffed. And you were going to tell me this when? Um, just now? She nickered. Great. Two songs. One by my great, great, etc. grandmother. Well, at least I know most of those by heart. But the other... I couldn't help but roll my eyes. As much as I adored Velvet Remedy's music and fell in love with her every song, tonight we were just looking for distraction. It didn't have to be perfect. You think you all be able to keep every set of eyes on you? Calamity asked. Velvet Remedy looked playfully insulted. Why, of course, dear. There won't be any eye for any pony else in that room. I believed it. I believed Velvet Remedy could keep every eye on her, even if Ditsy Doo was an audience. Suddenly, Velvet Remedy gasped. Every eye? I'll need a bath. Oh no, what am I going to wear? I can help with that. Velvet cocked her head. No, thank you. I can bathe myself quite well enough, dear. I stammered, flushing hotly. That wasn't what I meant, but now that she said it, I couldn't drive the image out of my mind. My heart fluttered in my chest. Calamity neighed and turned away. I'll give you two some private time for... He waved a hoof between us. Whatever this is. He made a quick exit, muttering something about helping God's ponies get their magical plasma cannon up and running before Red Eyes' forces could get here. I wasn't paying any attention. I only had eyes for Velvet Remedy, and I could feel my face burning. I... I stopped. I meant I have the perfect thing for you to wear. Focusing my magic, I opened my saddlebag and slid out the most beautiful dress in the wasteland, my find from Carousel Boutique. How can I fix this? How many times must I try? Please this time let me get it right, get it right. Velvet Remedy was gorgeous. The dress was perfect on her, making her more stunning than I had ever seen her before. Her horn was aglow, and the stage was awash with warm, colored light that shifted with her voice and the mood of the song. I rear upon my hooves, throw a buck in the air, and let firm resolve overwhelm my despair. She'd chosen as her first number that same incredibly heartbreaking song from the radio, something every pony would be familiar with. And she was more than doing it justice. She was... magnificent. I crouched on the balcony, covered in the ever-disgusting mattress cover. Sats was ready. My sniper rifle was loaded and tucked at my side. I actually hated myself for planning to ruin her performance. Dead Eyes hadn't been stupid. When I entered the balcony, I found a note had been left for me. One shot to the target, one to the table. The stage is rigged to explode if you shoot anything else. Celestia burn him. Even if I could get a message to Calamity, he was no better at disarming explosives than I was. Out of petty spite, I stole his copy of Applied Gemstones. Velvet Remedy drew the song to a tear-jerking close. The audience, scores of raider ponies, sat utterly stunned. Even God's beak had dropped. There were several seconds of dense quiet, the stage going dark save for the faintest glow of Remedy's horn. Then, an explosion of hoofbeats shook the mess hall, vibrating the balcony and sending bits of debris down from the roof as dozens of ponies' hoofs stomped in applause. I caught dead eyes shooting a glance up at the balcony. Out of the corner of her eye, God caught it too. She dipped her beak into a tin drinking cup, her gaze never leaving him. New music began to swell up from the stage, an orchestra and a single horn. Velvet Remedy began clopping hoof on the stage, setting rhythm. Soon, most of the ponies in the hall were matching her stomp. Enough of this slow stuff. Who's here to party? She bellowed out, drawing a roar from the crowd. My ears went up, my eyes widened. 
and for a moment I completely forgot about the sniper rifle at my side. All that mattered was that I didn't recognize the music. I'd never heard this song. Gallop, don't trot, night's burning hot, don't make me wait to go. Bands playing loud, screams of the crowd, this is what feeds my soul. If you're not smiling, you're not trying, start a riot, don't be a quiet, hoof to the floor, just give me some more, I need my rock and roll. Yeah. By Celestia's grace, she's gonna set off any explosive into the stage herself. I floated up my sniper rifle, now terrified of letting her complete the song. With the light and sound now bursting from the stage, Velvet Remedy had absolutely every pony's, and Griffin's, attention. By Luna, I could probably start shooting and no pony would notice until half the room was down. Well, if the stage didn't go up in a fireball. Don't be lazy, just go crazy, why don't you get it to a party? Flowing into the perfection of my Pitbuck's targeting spell, I locked onto a sequence of three targets. Blam. Blam. My first shot tore through the tin cup, splashing God with her drink and digging into the table. Before any pony could react, the second ripped the top half of Dead Eyes's head clean off, splattering several of the ponies in front of him. My third target was Velvet Remedy, who glowed with a light not of her own making as I telekinetically shoved her back through the heavy curtains and off the stage. True to Dead Eyes's word, the entire front of the stage detonated in a roar of fire and splinters not a breath later. Waves of ponies in the front row fell. I saw God stagger, bleeding from wooden shrapnel. I activated the stealth buck and galloped silently towards the stairs. From below, I could hear some pony yelling, It's the slavers! They're attacking early! Completely fair assumption, I thought as I hit the stairs. I was halfway down when an explosion from somewhere outside let me know that the panicking pony hadn't been completely wrong. As I raced for the terminal, my mind boggled at the coincidence. But no, I realized as I got to the desk and activated the terminal's single function, it wasn't coincidence at all. Red Eyes' slavers weren't going to trust Dead Eyes, just as Dead Eyes planned to betray them. They must have always intended to attack early. And right now, every single pony was in here. In accordance with the plan, even God was in attendance, as were her loyalists. We'd pulled all the ponies into one place and left the outskirts and guard posts undefended. Of course they would attack now. The stealth buck was just wearing off as I dashed into the room behind the curtains. I found Velvet Remedy pulling herself out of a pile of skeletons. Her perfect dress had bones hanging from it. Panting, I apologized, explaining about the note. She waved it off. Oh, that's quite all right. I'd much rather be buried in a pile of skeletons than actually join them. With a smile that melted my heart. Thank you, little Pip. Then, as an afterthought, couldn't let me finish the song, though. Sheepishly, I was afraid you'd set off the explosives yourself. I looked back towards the curtains. From the flickering light around their edges, the front side of the curtains was on fire. They were thick enough that the flames hadn't chewed their way through yet. I looked up. Black smoke was beginning to coat the ceiling. On the other side of the curtains, I heard gunfire and magical energy blasts being exchanged. I looked around for calamity. The rust-colored Pegasus galloped in a moment later, his black cowpony hat nearly falling off. A key dangled from a chain between his teeth. Velvet Remedy rolled her eyes with a laugh. He will actually stop to get the key. Calamity turned his head, hooking the chain to one of the guns on his battle saddle. Hells yeah, he grinned to Velvet. Depending on who wins here, I'm already making plans to swoop back in and loot the bodies. Velvet Remedy turned up her nose. Even I rolled my eyes. Then I turned and tried for the gate. Come on. Calamity bit the tip of my tail, stopping me. Whoa there, Dumplin. He nodded his head towards the gate. I turned to look. On the other side of the gate, between us and the now open metal door, were four turrets pointing right at me. I groaned. Turning back on the power had turned on the turrets, too. How could I have been so stupid as to not realize that would happen? I could have disabled them before, when it was safe. We take off on at once? Calamity asked. No. Hold on. Let me think. Why are we still going down there anyway? Velvet asked, clearly assuming the rest of the plan was a bust. I was tempted to agree. Now more than anything. I'm kind of hoping there's a back way out. I lifted my pit buck and looked at it. Okay, we're in luck. I've got one more stealth buck. I can use it to get up to the turrets and reprogram them, just like the ones back at the Pegasus convoy. That way they'll let us through and keep any pony who gets the idea to follow us out. We had a plan. I pulled the dead stealth buck out of my pit buck and slotted in my last one. Then I got to work.
We found ourselves creeping through caves converted to storage, piled with crates emblazoned with the name of Shattered Hoof Reeducational Stockyard. A few were marked with a circle proclaiming them Celestial Tier property and branded with either the initials MAS or MWT. Well, I whispered conversationally to my companions. I know MAS is the Ministry of Magic, but I haven't heard of the other one. Calamity stopped, an expression of confusion clouding his face. How does... Ministry of Arcane Sciences, Velvet Remedy explained casually before he heard something. A voice, low and deep, rumbled through the caves, bringing us all to a halt. So, you're the little ponies who have come to my town and made such a mess of things. You've killed my lieutenant, and now you've come from me. Mr. Topaz? Calamity asked, echoing my own thoughts. Either he was using an impressively well-hidden speaker system, or he was using magic to augment his voice. I suspected the latter, and that probably meant a unicorn. Or, a worse idea struck me. One of those pseudo-goddess things like the creature from old Appaloosa. And here I was, all out of boxcars. I quickly passed out the magical ammo, giving a prayer to Celestia and another to Luna. If Mr. Topaz was one of those monsters, we'd need all the divine assistance we could get. Calamity quickly changed the load on his battle saddle. Velvet Remedy, however, looked unimpressed. Her horn began to glow, and when she opened her mouth, her voice cried out from every rock and timber in the mines. Not impressed! Her knicker rang off the walls. Velvet Remedy turned down the awesome until her voice was only a little more terrifying than his. Now, why don't you be polite, stop playing games, and come and say hello? I floated up a little Macintosh and prepared for the appearance of what I had now convinced myself was one of those pseudo-goddesses. As the orange-scaled dragon loomed around the corner, licking his teeth, I realized I was so very wrong. Well, Calamity shouted as his wings propelled him down the caverns faster than Velvet Remedy or I could gallop. At least he's not a full-grown dragon! I poured on the speed, somehow managing to keep up with Velvet Remedy. Calamity was right. For what good it did us, Mr. Topaz was slightly smaller than a train car, not counting his sharply spiked tail. He could swallow me in one bite, but for Calamity he might require two. I don't see how that benefited him much. Using my magic, I ripped another support beam out of the wall as we raced past. I could hear rocks crashing down as the ceiling caved in. It wasn't stopping him, but at least I was slowing him down enough to stay ahead of those teeth. We could have tried diplomacy, Velvet cried out as she ran for her life, if Calamity hadn't shot first. My breathing was becoming labored, and stitches of fire were growing through my lungs. I could hear Mr. Topaz tearing through the newest collapse. Left ahead, I gasped. I was unable to stop and check my pit box auto map, but my eyes forward sparkle compass indicated we were circling around. At least we know the ammo works. Calamity spun in place, firing off twin shots at the dragon, then took a hard left, disappearing around the corner. We followed, not far behind. The hall we had just left turned into an inferno, the walls shaking from the dragon's roar. The ammo was working. The shots punctured right through the dragon's armored hide, but he was so big that they mostly seemed to just make him mad. Without slowing, Velvet laughed as he ran past a large metal door. Well, there's your vault. Any pony want to stop and open it? Smart-ass rhetorical question. Calamity stopped at the next junction, hovering in a nicely controlled panic. Little Piff, which way? Should be right ahead this time. At least, I really hoped so. If not, I was sending us into a dead end. With extra stress on dead. Calamity disappeared down the right passage. Luna and Celestia were with us. The choice had been right, and the passageway led us back to the first tunnel. Recognizing it, Calamity had already flown back into Shattered Hoof, where the battle between the raiders and slavers was fully engaged. Velvet Remedy was next out, but as I raced for the door, Mr. Topaz finally caught up. He opened his huge maw, teeth glistening. A drop of saliva fell onto my neck. The turrets opened fire as I raced through them. The dragon screamed. The sound rocked the mess hall and brought a temporary halt to the fighting as every pony turned to stare at the now quite wounded and extremely pissed off dragon as Mr. Topaz blasted all four turrets with fire. Internal components melted with a static hiss as they stopped. I felt the fire wash over me, my coat blackening and my skin blistering under the heat. One of my saddlebags caught fire. My sides burned from exertion. I tried to yell out to the others, but I couldn't get the breath. I wasn't going to make it outside before I collapsed. I veered away from the others as the fire began spreading from the saddlebag to the harness that held my sniper rifle. I was running for a hallway too narrow for the dragon. 
Behind me, the mess hall was washed in flames. Mr. Topaz was burning to death slaver and raider ponies alike. And then the dragon was gone. I collapsed against the wall of a washroom two corridors away from the mess hall, panting hard. Water filled the sink next to me, soaking my saddlebags and pouring onto the floor next to me. It felt cool against my burn-tortured skin. I flopped over, wallowing in the forming pool, wishing I could dip every part of me that hurt into it. I was crying. I tried not to think of how much it hurt, to focus elsewhere. It wasn't easy. The dragon, I assumed, had headed back into the mines. He could fly around the mess hall all he wanted, but the rest of the halls were too narrow for him. He was probably born down there, or... Velvet Remedy collapsed next to me, breathing heavily. It was nothing short of miraculous that neither of us were more gravely injured, much less dead. I tried to get up, but now that I'd stopped, my legs were refusing to work again. Where's... the... dragon? I panted, searching for confirmation of my theory. Velvet Remedy just shook her head. She didn't know. Where's... Calamity? I, uh... don't know. Lost a track. Damn it. Calamity wasn't foolish enough to go back down there after him. Or the vault. Was he? No, of course not. He just got separated, that's all. But if the slavers and raiders were still going at each other in the yard, it wasn't safe to stand around at the rendezvous point. Would he fly back to Junction R7 and wait for us there? Or engage the ponies fighting in... Oh, blessed Luna! Little Pip? Velvet Remedy, as exhausted as she was, held her ears alert. I'd realized that the giant hole torn in the razor wire over the yard must have been the work of the dragon. And that led me to... The cargo elevator! The dragon's going to come up through the rock yard! I hissed in pain as I tried to move. Velvet Remedy looked at me with alarm. Little Pip, here, let me... She weakly opened one of the yellow medical boxes she used as saddlebags and pulled out the very last of our healing bandages, as well as a syringe. This will dull the pain, she panted slowly. Trust me, you'll need it. She was very right. The painkiller helped. I screamed anyways. When Velvet Remedy had finished, I felt lightheaded and my vision was blurred with tears. I moaned weakly, my knees trembling as I finally got to my hooves. Little Pip, you're in no condition. But there was no conviction in Velvet Remedy's voice. Just sorrow. She knew as well as I that we couldn't stay here. And she knew that I had to try and help Calamity. Do we... have any buck in our supplies? I bit my lower lip, hating to ask her for such a thing. Velvet Remedy spared me her usual gasp of disapproval, simply bringing out the bottle and passing me a few of the yellowish-orange pills inside. Thanks. I whispered, floating them into my mouth. I stuck my head under the waterfall spilling out of the faucet and swallowed them without chewing. It took a few moments, long enough that I feared it wasn't going to have the effect I needed. A burst of energy flooded through me. I felt stronger, faster, less exhausted, and more awake. This... this was good. This would definitely do. I lifted my soaked saddlebag out of the sink and back onto my flanks, hissing as they rubbed against my bandaged skin. On second thought... I thought, lifting it off and then letting it float beside me. Turning to Velvet Remedy, I made an effort to keep from sounding bossy. Velvet, would you please try and find Calamity? Just be careful. Don't get caught. By any pony. She nodded. What are you going to try and do, little Pip? I glanced towards the door. I'm going back down. I'm going to get to that vault. If we're lucky, there'll be something inside that'll give us a chance against that dragon. But... Velvet Remedy frowned. Little Pip, you don't have the key. With a smile. When have I ever needed a key to get past a lock? The mess hall was a slaughterhouse. The charred frame of the stage was still licked with flame. The air was choked with smoke. The smell of roasted ponies, some of them still on fire, tried to strangle me. I was in a hurry, but I still took the time to snag a few of the random, less damaged weapons from the floor before I made my way past the heat-twisted gate and slagged turret. Behind me, the flame broiled cross from me that once held the stage curtains came crashing down. I made my way towards the vault. Turning a corner, I found myself face to face with a pony in leather armor wielding a magical energy lance. I couldn't tell which side she had been on, but it didn't matter. She immediately dropped into a combative stance. Wait. She thrust the glowing tip of the lance at me. I tried to dodge, my side slamming into the cave wall, 
A line of stinging agony swept across the side of my neck, my flesh bubbling and melting. Ow! The pony backed up, swinging the tip of the magic lance towards my head. I dropped to my belly, the lance passing over me, and flung my saddlebags into her face. The pony stumbled back. As she recovered, I kicked into sats and aimed one of the random weapons at her. My heart sank as I realized it was a magical energy rifle and I had no idea how to fire it. The pony thrust the lance towards my eyes and swung the rifle in its path, deflecting it. The rifle hissed and warped where the lance's tip connected. I dropped everything I was floating and charged the pony, head down. She swung the lance again, but I was inside of its reach. The shaft slapped against my side with enough force to bruise through my armored utility barding, but not enough to knock me off course. My horn punched through her armor and buried itself deep into her chest. I felt the lance bounce off my head as it dropped from her mouth. She tried to pull back, but I pushed forward until I felt her weaken, her body becoming dead weight. I stepped back, my horn coated in blood. The pony fell at my feet, still breathing slowly. I felt the blood trickle down my head. A drop fell into my left eye, tinting my sight with scarlet. Weakly, she whimpered, I don't want to die. I cringed. I tried to blink the blood out of my eye, but instead more drops fell in, blurring my vision. It's too late. I'm sorry. I was, honestly. I can't save you. I contemplated breaking her neck. She was already dead. Why make her suffer? I raised my hoof and stepped over her. I couldn't do that. No matter what I was allowing the wasteland to make me, I hadn't changed that much yet. I walked down the shaft a few more feet, then stopped and turned. I floated my saddlebags to me, opening them and drawing out my blanket. I gently laid it across her. Then I floated the weapons up from the ground, leaving the magical energy rifle, but adding her lance to my collection. I didn't have any further trouble before reaching the vault. The tumblers fell into place and the old metal door of the vault unlocked with a click. And then all the alarms went off. Apparently, while I didn't need a key to open the door, I did need to do so quietly. I planted my forehooves on the heavy metal door and, straining, pushed it open, something I almost certainly couldn't have done if I wasn't hyped on Buck. I stepped into the darkness beyond and focused, increasing the light from my horn to eliminate the room. There were many things I'd been expecting. This wasn't any of them. The room was filled, top to bottom, with shelves of memory orbs. Each orb was tagged with a date and guest number. There must have been hundreds of them. My ears and tail drooped. There was nothing here that would help me against. Well, well, aren't you insistent? I spun around. Mr. Topaz was crouched at the door of the vault, the dragon's head sticking in. He was too broad at the shoulders to fit, but he completely blocked my only exit. And one breath of fire would incinerate everything in the vault. I was on my way up to chomp a few of your friends outside, particularly that delicious-looking pegasus when you just had to ring the dinner bell. I was able to back just out of chomping range before my tail hit the back shelf, sending memory orbs falling to the floor. I looked around frantically, but there was no place to hide or flee. You just had to get yourself eaten first. I admire that perseverance, the dragon joked wickedly. First? Mr. Topaz was sadistic, but at least he was talkative. If I could keep him speaking, maybe I could figure a way out. I tried racking my brain for some telekinetic trick that could save my hide. The gemstones are dessert, of course. You ponies are the main course. The dragon scowled, making me want to scream. Of course, you went and mucked everything up. I spend all this time and effort ensuring a harvest perfect for a final priestly meal. And now most of them are dead. His glare was filled with hatred. You little ponies taste so much better alive. I backpedaled, pressing myself into the shelf, knocking down dozens of the little mystical orbs which scattered across the floor, rolling in all directions. The dragon's gaze was drawn momentarily to one of the rolling balls. What exactly were you expecting to find in here anyways? Mountains of gems? Because you thought I'd enjoy needing to call down that imbecile dead eyes every time I get a bit peckish? Did you even look in the crates? No. He laughed the breath of his merriment heating the room until I felt I would faint. I lost all focus, my saddlebags and collected weapons clattering to the ground. He glanced at them with amusement. 
Or was it weapons? Did you hope to find a magical shotgun of dragon slaying, perhaps? Because there would ever be a dragon suicidal enough to keep something like that around the house. N no, no, no. I said again, although this time he'd been fairly on the nose. The dragon reached into the room and flicked one of the orbs at me with a claw. Go ahead. Try one. You died for this, after all. I was going to die. Hesitantly, I reached a hoof towards one of the orbs, but then drew back. I was sweating profusely. The heat in the room was draining my strength, and soon I wouldn't be able to stand. And still, the only strategy I had was to keep him talking. What... what are they? Confessions. The dragon smiled cruelly. Seems the old mayor of your Ministry of Morale didn't exactly trust normal methods of interrogation. Some incident in her youth or something. So instead, they trained up unicorns like yourself to sift through other ponies' memories, find the condemning thoughts or experiences, and rip them out for public record. Didn't want any innocent ponies getting sent to Shattered Hoof, after all. What? But that's... Of course, not every pony came out of the process in the same condition they went in, mentally speaking. But what is it you ponies say? Can't bake a pie without dicing some apples? He laughed again. This time I did lose consciousness. Only for a moment, I think. But I found myself laying on the floor with no memory of falling. That's awful. The dragon stopped laughing. You see, little pony. Look at what you ponies are doing to each other up there. Look at what you did to each other in here. What makes you think your pathetic and wicked species is worth being anything other than dragon food? I tried to get up. I just couldn't. The heat was making all of my burns blaze in agony. I felt like I was on fire again, only this time it was worse. I cried out. The dragon was going to eat me. There were no options, no tricks, no other ways out. I was going to die here, like this, alone in a tiny metal room underneath of a prison. But still, I tried to answer. Not all of us are bad. Some of us are good. The dragon snorted, adding smoke to the heat. Yes, I can see that. He was staring at me, and it took a moment for me to realize he was staring at my horn. The heat had caked the blood. Mockingly, he offered. Well, I suppose some of you are good, with ketchup. Makes your ponies nice and slippery going down. I cringed, fearing he would laugh again. The air was almost too hot to breathe. Although I personally prefer mustard. The mine shaft outside erupted in green liquid fire. The blast catching the dragon in the side with enough force to yank his head out of the room, sending him sprawling. Yee-haw! Blessed cool air swam into the room, clearing my head. That was Calamity's voice. How you like them apples? Calamity flapped into view, carrying the magical plasma cannon from Junction R7. Hey, little pip. Boy, am I glad to see you're okay. Sorry it took me so long to get back. These things are awfully heavy when not properly mounted. The monstrous tri-barreled weapon was bigger than he was, strapped to his underbelly with its power array attached to the top of his battle saddle with rope. I found myself giggling half hysterically. <laughs> you, you look ridiculous. Yeah, well... Calamity's jovial voice cut off. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. What? He's getting back up. Run! Run was a bit more than I could manage. A third of my body felt like it was being held to a flame. I staggered, trying to focus. My saddlebag started to lift. Calamity fired again, the blast from the cannon obliterating the air, the kick sending the Pegasus pony hurling backwards. The dragon roared in pain and rage. Glorious Luna, what does it take to kill one of these things? Telekinetically grabbing the rest of my possessions, I dashed out the door. Calamity was biting off the ropes holding the cannon. Can't carry this and you at the same time. I looked back. The dragon was badly wounded, possibly mortally. One of his wings was warped and deformed. The scales on his side had melted back against his ribs. One of his legs was a deformed stump. And still he was getting back up, his eyes filled with rage. He opened his mouth to bellow fire. The fire was only a fraction of the blasts he had managed before. I felt the wave of superheated air that rode in front of it, but the flames didn't reach us. 
Moments later, Calamity was pulling me through the air, up out the hole left by the lowered hydraulic cargo lift and into the cloudy sky. We shot past God, engaged in a brutal aerial combat with the two griffins from the slaver camp. Out of the corner of my non-blooded eye, I saw her draw that magical energy shotgun and empty it point-blank into the breast of one of her opponents. Beneath us, the chaos of warring ponies filled the rockyard, explosions and bursts of magical energy forming a violent dance of carnage around the dark, hollow square of the lift. The dragon, impossibly, followed. Even with its ruined wing, the dragon was faster than we were, tearing through the hole in the razor mesh in pursuit of us. Clammy would have been more maneuverable had his wing been fully healed and he wasn't carrying the extra weight. As it was, we were a two-pony flying brick. As the dragon drew closer, Mr. Topaz opened his maw wide. Glancing back, I saw rows of viciously sharp teeth surrounding a dark, insatiable gullet. I had an idea. Keep flying straight! Clammy grunted, straining his wings for more speed. I hope you know what you're doing. I opened my saddlebag and pulled out the rest of my grenades. All of them. I noted with terror-tinged amusement that they really did look like metal apples. How do you like... I whispered as I let go of everything but the stems, sending the grenades right into the dragon's ravenous mouth. Even as they disappeared, it occurred to me that I might have made a horrible mistake. Dragons can breathe fire and eat gems. What made me think a few grenades could cause anything more than indigestion? A moment later, I learned my reservations were right, as the grenades did absolutely no harm to the healthy parts of the dragon but blew out his damaged side, warped and deteriorated by potent assaults of magical plasma in a sick blast of gore. Mr. Topaz, a gaping hole in his side larger than three full ponies, was almost certainly dead before he hit the ground messily and skidded thirty yards, leaving a swath of blood and internal fluids. Calamity turned and banked, taking us back to the junction. There were still battles raging in parts of Shattered Hoof, but we had both had enough excitement for the night. Ah, horse apples, Calamity said wearily. I almost forgot about Velvet Remedy. Before I could panic, he informed me. She's hid herself in the visitor's center. I told her I'd be right back for her. Gently, he set me down, and then flapped back into the night, looking utterly exhausted. I sat there, waiting for him to return, and at some point, I fell asleep.